emotions include physiological, cognitive, and behavioral components, and different theories of emotion assign different levels of importance to each component. The James Lang theory suggests that emotions stem from physiological arousal. Different arousal patterns are associated with different feelings, happiness, sadness, and so on. For instance, if a snake were nearby, the sympathetic nervous system would activate their fight or flight system to manage a threat, causing a sharp increase in heart rate and respiration. According to the James Lang theory of emotion, this physical response would then lead to the emotion of fear. But other research pointed out that physiological arousal does not vary enough to explain the different types of emotions that people experience. In response, the Cannon Bard theory distinguishes physiological arousal and emotional experiences as two separate yet simultaneous occurrences. So if that snake is nearby, a person feels fear at the same time as the physical arousal from the fight or flight response. The related Schachter Singer two factor theory also holds that physiological and cognitive factors contribute to emotion. It states that arousal is interpreted in context to produce an emotional experience. So that snake activates the sympathetic nervous system, is cognitively labeled as fear because of the context, the vicious snake. No matter how they interact, it is clear that our feelings are linked to physiological experiences, what researchers refer to as embodied emotion. For example, anxiety may involve sweating, feeling cold, and having butterflies in the stomach, while anger could involve a clenched jaw, a pounding heart, and feeling hot. The physiological arousal and bodily reactions linked to feelings help determine the intensity of emotions, since stronger physical reactions are linked to stronger emotions. This has led to the interesting side effect that our interpretation of physical symptoms matters a great deal. Going back to the snake example, if someone were to experience the same physiological symptoms, like a pounding heart, in the context of a first date, they would interpret it much differently. How people interpret information is influenced by their experience, background, and culture, which leads people to have very different emotional experiences even when their circumstances are similar. For example, I love roller coasters. My heart pounds, my stomach drops, and I interpret this as pleasurable and exciting. Other people, not so much. They feel the same symptoms and experience it as fear or anxiety. Another important part of studying emotions involves how we interpret the emotions of others. Emotions can be conveyed through body language, nonverbal communication expressed consciously or unconsciously through gestures, postures, and movements, and through facial expressions. Emotions are positions of the facial muscles that convey emotions. The facial expressions used to convey happiness, surprise, sadness, fear, disgust, contempt, and anger are similar across developmental periods and cultures. They even occur in people who have been blind since birth and have never witnessed these expressions. These cultural and developmental similarities have led researchers to call these emotions the universal emotions. But even with these universal emotions being constant, culture can still play an important role in how people display emotions. For example, rules about the expression of sadness can vary by age, sex, and culture. In America, young children can often cry in public without facing stigma. Whereas if a grown man were to do this, he unfortunately might be ridiculed. These factors are known as display rules, standard ways of expressing emotions within a group or culture. It's extremely useful for us to be able to look at the faces of others around us and tell whether or not someone is happy or sad. But sometimes people experience emotions that they don't want to reveal to others. They might do their best to hide this, but they run the risk of nonverbal leakage, revealing an emotional state through body language or facial expression despite a desire to conceal it. For example, a person who discovers that a coworker got the promotion they'd hoped to get may show a flash of jealousy or sadness when offering their congratulations. While people can control some amount of their outward expression of emotion, few people can control their physiological experiences. Research on facial expressions and emotions have shown that the relationship between the two is more complex than you might expect. Most people assume that emotions drive facial expressions, that when people are happy, they smile. But the facial feedback hypothesis suggests that it works the other way around, that facial expressions can influence emotions and change moods. For example, when people hold a pen between their teeth, which looks pretty funny, it actually activates the same muscles as when we smile, and they tend to rate cartoons as funnier than when they hold a pen between their lips. 
If this surprises you, it doesn't actually surprise psychologists, because it turns out that we're all pretty bad at predicting what will make us happy. For example, in the United States, people often believe that having more money will make them significantly happier. However, research shows that this isn't true. When people have enough money to meet basic needs and buy a few luxuries, wealth isn't a strong predictor of happiness. People also do a poor job of predicting future emotions. Whether a situation is positive or negative, they tend to believe that the resulting emotions will last longer than they actually do, like thinking that they would be happy forever if they won the lottery. In reality, people display hedonic adaptation, the tendency to return quickly to baseline levels of happiness after positive or negative events. One thing that we are good at, though, is minor self-deception. People often have unrealistically favorable attitudes towards themselves or the people around them, a phenomenon known as positive illusions. These positive illusions help people maintain self-esteem, feel good, and keep discomfort at bay, at least for a little while. But what really makes us happy? Positive psychology is the branch of psychology that examines the biological, social, and cultural factors that boost happiness and make life more worthwhile and fulfilling. Research shows that happiness is linked to close relationships, helping others, enjoying one's job, and having a sense of purpose. Other factors highly correlated with happiness include a sense of belonging, sharing thoughts and beliefs with others, and expressing gratitude or appreciation. So if you want to increase your well-being, spend your time learning new things, having new experiences, and immersing yourself in activities with those you love.